Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome back to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. It's called World War Three. We have Steve and Mark and me. That's why it's called World War Three. Not because the world seems like it's in another world. Uh, war? War? Maybe? War? Is war on everybody's mind or is it just me? I think it's just you. <laughs> <laughs> it's always, definitely around. I'm always mm-hmm. thinking about conquesting something, you know, like if it's the next challenge, if it's that, you know what they say? It's like a battle. Is it a battle uphill or is it a battle on the hill i don't know it's always happens to do with a hill and i don't know which hill it is and i feel bad you are. <laughs> look uh you got, there's, a, there's a problem in the world robbie when you consult you know two nominal experts on uh, ancient greek history about a war that's currently going on in ukraine um you know if we were to apply history's maxims to the to the future it wouldn't look good for the ukrainians at this point in time but uh, let's hope it turns out a little bit better but is it it's not different. Like I'm trying to think because like I, I think when you look at like if, if you're going to put someone like me or someone like a kid back in the old school, like ancient, like history type days, you would have a master strategic planner, in my opinion, just because video games, a lot of them are now turn based. A lot of them are strategy based. A lot of people are thinking like two steps ahead rather than th- thinking two steps back in some cases. Now, in other situations, like if we're saying, look both ways before you cross the street. Now that's where we've completely lost it. People don't know how to do that anymore. But back in the day, it's like you would think with all the amount of assassinations you heard about or stabbings or killings or, you know, your best friend stabbed you and then banged your sister. You had to kind of think that, like, did they not think that this was going to happen? Like, this seems like a common case scenario back in the day. So I'm wondering when someone like Putin says, I'm going to invade Ukraine. Like, did we not take him at face value? Like, I mean, I, I for me, I would be like, he's not joking. Like, I, I he's not that good of a poker player. Yeah, but I mean, I think um, a lot of the motivations for war remain the same through the ages too, whether it's protecting your borders, um, trade routes, often money's a, a big factor in in why wars break out. But um, yeah, I think through the ages, the, the reasons remain much the same um, for why countries would go to war or city-states would go to war. So as for why he wasn't taken at face value, I'd I don't know. Um, Again, it probably goes deeper into the issues to do with this particular conflict as well, which by the looks of it is rooted into history that's, you know, over 100 years old as well. Steve? Yeah, look, absolutely. Um, I try to draw, you know, always try to draw definitions, um, you know, to and from. The thing is, like, this is a this is a different type of war. You know, you're dealing with a, a state that was once upon a time, you know, part of a, you know, collective Soviet Union. And has broken away, but then you know there's there's hundreds, if not a thousand, years of history that goes on between those two states back and forth. You know, it's not so simple to to sort of contextualize in the, in the idea of war. But if you look at like you know World War One's a good example. World War One is a classic tale of war. Um, you know, complex alliances, um, two sort of you know major power, polarized um, oppositions, and small states that have the ability to bring larger states into war. Like you know, if you look at the Peloponnesian War between Athens and Sparta which was really a, a war against the, the two leagues those cities had. Once again, it was a very small city creating the, the pretext, you know, like in 1914, it was the assassination of the um, Duke Ferdinand. In uh, the Peloponnesian War, it was basically a, a very small city that was close to Sparta, uh, was so close to Athens called Megara, that, that dragged in sort of the, the Spartan alliance and the Athenian alliance into a, into a broader war. There were other things involved. Um, you know, there was religious disputes and things like that, but... Um, yeah, those sorts of wars are easy to, to understand. This is a this is a funny war. This one, I I, I struggle to contextualize it. Well, I guess the main point or the main thing I'm kind of like analyzing here is like there's very few things that it seems like as much as people say like oh it's another world war it's another world war it's, or it's like wars right on the front or they're saying it's always at the trigger I would say um, there's very few things that people will go to war for like it's either love it's 
um, it's uh, something, maybe family, um, if you feel like something's been taken from you, or if you feel like you've been slighted. I mean, we see like different types of like styles of like threatening of war. And that's always on the horizon. I mean, the fact that it hasn't happened yet. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to, I guess, trying to choose my words here carefully. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm d dismissing it or I'm saying it's or belittling it in any way. I'm just saying that it's always like the fact that it doesn't happen 24 seven. I mean, it's the same fact we're not hit by an asteroid on planet earth. I mean, it's just a luck case scenario. If one person's having a bad day and they want to threaten it out there, which seems like it happens all the time, but it seems like a lot of it happens to do with perspectives and the perspective that I can see is that I guess Ukraine, they feel like Russia feels like that they're entitled to Ukraine and Ukraine feels separate, kind of like a Brexit situation with the UK, where they kind of slide it off in a sense. So you can understand it from that perspective. But the one I'm looking at is the chess game, the long game, which is for the United States, for just from my kind of perspective over here, if the Ukraine asked the United States for help. United States tried to do a bunch of cyber warfare attacks onto Russia, trying to shut down their systems to be able to help out in the situation because we can't go over there with troops. If your Ukraine is one of your supporters, which is I'm saying the states, the best way to end up leading into attack on the U.S. or something like that is to make sure that all your supporters hate you. And that's because when they needed you, you didn't show up. So when you need them, you they don't show up. That's what I'm looking at. Like, I'm looking at the long game. This is a strategic move. It's much like China. China, like, basically creates everything that we use in the U.S. I mean, we're now starting to get more of, like, industry stuff support for the United States. But I look at, like, this is, like, this is all chess. This is, like, the longest game of world domination. Like, my whole point here, my whole side, I would say my thoughts are, is that I don't think we should have – we shouldn't have our states wise, we shouldn't have our hands in every other country expecting them to go by like what we go by. Every state is different. But if you notice, even with climate change or all these topics that get talked about, they're, they're giving you a like, oh, we can't do wind power because it costs this much money. And we saw that over there in China. It's like, well, why are we examining what happened in China and not try it over here? You're basing. I get it. Oh, you, you know, the past is the best predictor of the future. If someone makes a mistake, you can learn from their mistakes. Well, that doesn't work depending on your regions. We have different landscapes. We have different environments. One person's going to end up changing into like all solar energy doesn't mean the other person should stop changing into like hydro energy or something like that because you're in different areas you're in different lands your problems are going to be different just like people mental health for instance you can't just give a band-aid to fix everything you got to focus on the individual person if that person's experiencing like a bipolar disorder you can't treat them the same thing you treat someone with schizophrenia so it doesn't make sense why you're trying to base your decisions as a country bases on another person's country like you have to take it for yourself and take it as your own it's like back in the day cities didn't even they weren't able to communicate or at least as effectively as we can with our devices and stuff like that a message would get sent on a horse and then it would go like two weeks and that person would end up dying or something like that then you have to go tell the wife like i'm so sorry your husband died i um, trying to deliver a message that we're having a feast on friday night and by the time the message got there it was uh, three weeks past um but it, it, it's in my opinion i look at this like you would really trying to examine what's best case scenario for your home state or your country or your city. And it seems like that's been lost from the translation from the old world into the new age that we're in. A lot of people and not just my country, every country is trying to make decisions off of everything that they see from another person's route or perspective. When back in the day, all you knew was what happened in your city. Or maybe what happened from a message that got delivered from another if a city fell or something like that. But every king's decision, there wasn't you didn't know what they were doing at every single moment of every single day. And I feel like that's what made them a little bit more effective is that they were more grounded into their roots about where they base their civilization and how they build it. I mean, am I wrong? You can tell me if I am. Yeah, well, I think um, a country's got to take into account its own circumstances and, and work with that because, like you said, not everything that happens in one particular country is not going to work in another. And that's based on a whole range of factors, whether to do with their economic um, structures, uh, their geography, their climate, all sorts of stuff is going to be quite different. But um, I think like what, what, what we see with Ukraine, because I mean, you got uh, a lot of people that are 
I think, uh, sort of questioning the United States, why why aren't you coming in and helping out or, or whatever else? But they need to analyse what's really going on because you, by interfering too far, you also um, risk blowing the whole um, crisis out even further and uh, it compounds and then next thing you know, by intervening, you've um, turned the conflict into something much larger than what perhaps it uh, might might have been in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. And look, and look, we're also, you know, at the end of the day, we're talking about people, just a select group of people arguing about something like, you know, the the implications of those decisions might have, you know, a really broad scope and you know, result in the, lo- the loss of you know, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of lives as it has in the past. But at the core of it, it's just a couple of people not being able to get along, you know, like you're looking at, you know, the lead- leaders of Europe, leaders of NATO, um, the, obviously the communist regime, like they're always tough to deal with, but like people cannot sit down in a room and actually nut these things out. So instead they've got to be as they were in days past sorted out on the battlefield. Um, and unfor- it's unfortunate, but I don't think the human race has moved past to a point where, you know, just diplomacy can, can fix things. So, you know, I think regardless of the circumstances that are going on internally, you know, like trade concerns and things like that, these are all, you know, what, what they call, you know, casus bellies, you know, like they're, they're um, pretexts for war, but, at the bottom of it, it's just, you know, you're in a room with somebody who you just can't get along with. So rather than, you know, agree to disagree, we'll send in the army. That's how it always goes. Yeah, but and I think I will say, is it like another Caesar situation? Like, I, I feel like if you're going to say like, oh, shake your hands and be friends, that means that even if you guys aren't thinking it 100% in your minds, for instance, if we were all, we're all friends here, but if we weren't friends and we were just getting along for the sake of doing a show or something like that, which I hope is not the case because I love both of you deeply. Um, but it, it, it like, w- w- that's not a real friendship, but the idea is that it's for future generations. So we don't have to worry about damages causing on to future generations. Heads. So there's the start. Everyone is willing to get together for agreement of the future generations and our future of our countries, right? Even if it's for selfish intent of you don't want your country to be destroyed. That's the initial start of hope. But I feel like they haven't sat down and had enough beer or whiskey together or whatever the hell. They haven't had these interactions unless it's a professional circumstances with cameras rolling. Like, I feel like that's and the reason why this is on my mind is because it's all over fucking Twitter. It's all over everywhere you look right now, which is good because I'm glad people are talking about it. But I don't need to see some person who's sitting in their fucking house talking about why can't we just get along? No, it just we we need to fucking figure something out when it comes to not being in each other's lives 24 sevens when it comes to national literally circumstances. If one person wants to build something onto another thing, that's between that and that country. That's not between every single person out there. That's the issue is that you have a bunch of people that are governing by the rules of just smiling in public and then in private talking shit on each other. You can't have that. And what happens is you need to have better communication and it shouldn't be when cameras are rolling. Every national trade agreement comes with cameras rolling just because what the public needs to be informed no i honestly think that putin and all every single leader even biden if he can stumble his ass up just go to a bar have a whiskey do something like go to a di- fucking disney world like I, I hate to be that guy that's pushing people towards the illuminati of the disney world but i mean people seem like they have a lot of fun so if you make a good connection or a good relationship there i just feel like you shouldn't be walking around eggshells around people that you say are your friends when really they're not you're just waiting for someone to stab you in the back or you end up in another caesar situation yeah and trust is a a big factor here i mean especially this conflict i mean if you were going to try and make an agreement how are you uh, going to know that um your adversary is going to be talking in good faith and especially with the whole um i guess american and russian um dynamics have been going on for decades the uh, i mean the amount of backstabbing and uh, you know trying to do things behind closed doors without the other knowing was just was constant so it's the trust level is is huge there so when you're trying to sit in a room and and discuss something you're constantly thinking what are they going to do to try and weasel out of this or um if we agree to this then they're probably going to try and you know maneuver around what we do here and take advantage of us so we can't do that so you always have this sort of uh, agreements that just don't take place because they just can't trust each other yeah absolutely absolutely and um you know there's there's always a caesar in the room um, 100% when these people, you know, can't sort of bring themselves together 
and figure out a way to to get out of the situation yeah that's exactly where we are right now and what i was telling mark off air before you came in steve was um i've been getting super interested into just theories and hypotheses even ones that have been debunked now here's the issue i don't take anything that i read face value for that i have to experience the person before i understand and the issue with a lot of these debunked like i was looking up uh because i'm a moon landing is fake guy or i like to entertain that one out of everything and um, i was looking at the people and a lot of them are musicians who believe it but there's like 10 people on wikipedia and a lot of them in the thing it says it's a white nationalist i'm like what is that so this person's like a white supremacist I don't know because what are the, what are the what is their perspective like are they are they really like that have they been openly like that or someone have been blackmailing them or discrediting them much like the media likes to do I mean they do that all the time with any you can name a person Trump he's a Nazi he's all this type of stuff Ben Shapiro's a Nazi and he's a Jew like he's one of my people so you get to this point where it's like does that make any sense but people you don't know what's real anymore because the media stopped caring and the media stopped letting you know the information that is true they rather just go to whatever narrative narrative that their audience is and that becomes an issue as well too but when i was getting into these theories a lot of the ones that are have been debunked are ones that are like kind of like oh this is a pseudoscience or something like that one that i've started to really kind of take hold to and i've actually had this person on my show to talk about it it's um the i think it's media hypothesis which is that the world has like this kind of suicidal tendency now wikipedia has you know what i'm talking about steve okay Peter Ward, I had him on my show. So he's a respected paleontologist, but he was explaining the idea to me. And I was like, well, Wikipedia has wrote it that you think that like people have like suicidal intent in them. He goes, no, but every organism or this multicellular thing, all of us together on this planet is basically destroying itself. And you can see that with climate. You can see that with war. You can see that with anything. I think that's just an inherent trait inside people. I mean, the idea that people just want to conquer people want more that's everything that everyone's ever wanted that's all that was based that's all you did back in the day too was just fighting eating and then fucking i mean it's the three it's the three f's well well fighting food and then fucking yeah okay perfect yeah 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 still close yeah it, i think it fits into self-preservation doesn't it in some respects yeah absolutely i mean i think and i think you know that's it's self-preservation it's you know like i think robbie spelled it out pretty well you know it's the the distrust of the, oh, sorry, yourself, Mark, the distrust of the person, you know, in the room with you as well, you know, like it, it just all feeds into it. And it's, the situation's never changed. You know, we might think that we're in, enlightened in this day and age and, you know, we've got the power of, of God in our hands practically with, with mobile phones. But uh, at the end of the day, the, the impulses that, that drive hum, human interaction, um, you know, have remained the same. Yeah, and, and you can see it in the culture wars, you know, like the, the idea is that you, you know, you otherize a certain group of people, um, which if you, you know, look into the Russian propaganda is what the Russians are doing in regards to the Ukrainians, you know, accusing them of um, genocide and infanticide and, you know, the use of chemical warfare, like, you know, they're you know, painting a picture that they, they want to promote, you know, and, and to, to a large degree, the West does that as well. Like, you know, everybody's guilty of, of that. You know, we paint the Russians into, you know, the, the big bad guys. And look, they are, I guess, on a, on a governmental level, you know, they are the bad guys compared to us. They're sort of antithetical to our own style of, style of government, but Russians in general aren't bad people. But, you know, like, the idea is to other that way you can, you know, you can mm. push your own agenda and you can do things that, that you want to do with public support and the public will support a great deal. If you can, you know, paint the right story. Yeah, it's a yeah, sales if pitch. Do, if you demonize your, uh, your enemy, it makes it much harder to convince others to, uh, to fight on your side as well, or to have your population assist in your aims to, um, to defeating your enemy. And uh, yeah, the best way to do that is to, to paint your enemy in the, the worst light possible um you, you want to sort of get rid of any of the gray areas that show where perhaps some agreement failed where you know both parties had something they could have done more to maybe prevent um what took place but yeah you once uh once you get to war it, that that all sort of shifts aside and you want to demonize them as much as possible so that everyone will uh that's well your population will all be back behind you and and uh willing to fight well, I'm going to ask this question to um, you both separately. Um, and then afterwards, if you guys have anything new that you want to switch the topic over to, you can, because I didn't mean to hijack the whole episode. Um, but when you guys are doing your research um, and both in your respective kind of podcasts as well, too, have you come across any theories or ideas that might have been dropped off that kind of seem like they would be really fit to bring back today? Like, because when I'm looking at all these societal theories and that goes to like philosophy, 
philosophies of the mind. It goes into theories of the mind. It goes into like pseudo archaeology, which is like the younger driest impact theory, um, which I've had people on explain that as well, too. That it, it, a lot of it just seems like, man, it's especially when it comes to the philosophy of the mind. Like, I think all of them are not really wrong. I think they're all right in a sense. I think it just, it's depending on the person. And the one that we really accept is the one that we, is like most common, I would say. But if we, if nobody's the exact same as the person beside them. Everyone's a little bit different in their thoughts and ideas and even in their emotions. I mean, there's a theory out there that's been debunked saying it's, it's a wrong. It's been, you know, it's been like rejected by society, which is that people act more with emotion than they do with thought. I don't know. Today, that seems like the clearest one, to be 100% honest. So many people act at the first trigger of whatever they hear. They don't even care. They just see it, uh, whatever they get Manchurian candidated by one of the words that they see, and they just run off and start tweeting. Like, um, we were going to go to war with uh, Steve's friend who said I was a child, um, which I mean, he's not wrong. Steve knows who I'm talking about. Um, but that that person doesn't know me that person doesn't know steve it, it just hears something they don't like and they immediately get triggered that's what i mean that theory to me the emotion before thought is a hundred percent true to what happens today i mean most of the cases yeah yeah look um in answer to your i guess your question um the the, the correct way to comport oneself you know the way to live the ideally ideally philosophical life was something that the the ancients definitely dwelt you know long and hard on um you know a lot of the surviving texts of um plato and aristotle you know revolve around that exact topic you know and they're born out of i guess the development of of that sort of philosophy from socrates prior to them um who unfortunately didn't leave any writings but you know, these people not only you know thought long and hard about you know what was the correct way to spend one's life the right way to be a citizen um you know the right way to to be happy or not happy probably content would probably be a better word um for the greeks happiness was sort of a something that happened occasionally when when you got everything else right but um yeah look those things have, have dropped off you know like those those writings still survive you know people aren't you know philosophically inclined to to follow the the dictums of the old ways um but you just still find people that you know are in in that game in the philosophy game you know academically uh still you know subscribe to the to stoicism or epicureanism whatever, whatever whichever way they like you know so that that thought's still out there but those would be the things that have dropped off you know that was far more prevalent in the ancient world like a lot of people took that stuff yeah if you say more. you're about say if you say you're a philosopher now or you have it in your twitter people just like <clears throat> yeah whatever it's like it's not even respected anymore when back in the day that was all that was respected 100%, you know, they just want to see, like, you know, like how many TikTok followers you've got these days. That's about it. But, um, yeah, that'd be my answer. Yeah, well, my the first thought that entered in my mind wasn't so deep. It was more um, to do with, with politics and how, um, especially once into the uh, more classical period where leaders, after their term in service, are often put on, I guess, sort of like a trial where they'd be judged on the decisions they made uh, while they're in power. And uh, then it was seen they were judged whether those were in the best interests of the city or, or had they had served their own personal interests. And um, obviously, if they had been judged to have done the right thing, then they would have a, a sort of a prosperous uh, career after their public service. If not, then they probably faced exile. And um, perhaps that could be uh, an idea that's brought back. Steve? Yeah, no, I was just going to, actually down ask Mark, Mark just to, on on a side note for yourself. I mean, as somebody that's you know served his country, like what what is it that like you know like because there's a lot of people around talking about you know you should you know stand up and fight you know get your guns like you know they're, they're sort of encouraging you know militant actions in Ukraine you know like what what does it actually take to to serve you know willingly? Yeah, well, I think um, it's something that. Hmm. I've, I've often thought about this and sort of look back at my own sort of thought processes. And I think that that line of thinking, like the whole uh, nationalist style thinking of doing the right thing by your country and um, serving and, and whatever else, I think it's much stronger the younger you are, I think. So, and I think that also fits in with uh, as you're much younger, you're sort of looking for something to belong to as well that's bigger than yourself. And I think as you get older, well, I have discovered that uh, perhaps that type of thinking starts to wane a bit when you experience the world a bit more and 
uh, perhaps come a little bit more cynical of uh, those institutions that you thought had every, you know, your best intentions at heart and, and whatever else. But I think definitely in the uh, earlier ages, like your early 20s and that, that's what I found was uh, you just had this, it was almost like a, uh, you wouldn't question it. It was just, of course, I would go serve. I would go do this. I would go do that. Um, I'm defending my country. I'm serving. And and that was kind of it. But um, yeah, so I've got older. It's that sort of thought process has changed a bit. I look at, um, if you look at back in the day, how many kids were really writing down scripture and talking about a perfect world or Eden or a place of like, I guess a, what it would be like a philosophy philosophical quote and then you look at today's time how many kids are doing that now and how many older people are just staying complacent in the lives that they live see people want change until it affects their daily routine and you can see that they don't want change anymore they want change that happens in something else that doesn't affect their daily life so i mean if you look back in the day for instance kids were running around with sticks trying to chase rats and trying to find a way to hunt and you know have fun and kill things and do with stuff that kids are supposed to do in a sense back in the day or just be free be creative but the older people were the philosophers writing down tablets and writing down scripture or writing whatever whatever ideas maybe even atlantis which i still believe is a possibility that could be real um but then if you look at today's age it's the complete opposite you have older people that just want to go to their job and complain about politics and all that type of stuff but there's not really any writings of a perfect future anymore if anything we're still writing about the future and now we're writing it in a new advanced digital age but it's mostly kids that are doing it now as well too besides like the sci-fi writers and actual writers that are actually writing books like authors and all that but like the idea is that people would scribble things down all the time people would have these intellectual like graphs or leaps for advancement and that would be mostly in the older class back in the day if I, I, if i'm not wrong but the younger kids today are now doing that and it doesn't get taken at face value because of their age see age and wisdom was based on they were basically linked together it was experience was supposed to be off of how, how long you've lived an older man a wise man always respect your elders that type of thinking now you have kids that are thinking in this type of way and i don't understand is that shift because there's more of a an awareness at a younger age or is it a more sense of I, I wouldn't say critical thinking at all I don't think that's critical thinking I think it's just more kids getting involved in maybe things that they probably should wait until they get older to get involved in it but it seems like the older crew or the older people like my parents age or my grandparents age they're just not dealing with it anymore they don't care they are trying to just manage the lives that they're in because they built their families and it's hard to get invested in the stuff when you have a family. I get why so many people drop off on the politics type talking, but it seems like there's an undesired interest in the fate of the world. And I don't like this idea that people can write down literature or scripture or by scripture, I mean, just advanced writings when it comes to a perfect Eden how many people really actually want that? Like, is there a large amount of people that think that's actually possible? Because in my head, I don't think there's an ever an idea of world peace. You're just never going to have that. But there's a way of not fighting. Like, there doesn't need to be peace. But you also don't need to associate with that person every single day. Like, this idea that we can all sit in a circle and do kumbaya or live in this perfect utopian age where we're all walking around in toga robes saying thank you as we get on like a tube that shoots us off into the moon or something like that like that is not in my head possible only because there's too many people wanting to do their moves because all they're worried about is the things that they know and they aren't worried about some person's kids out there because they don't know that person's kids yeah look um on the topic of peace it's it's actually always really fascinated me. Um, you know, war, war is very interesting, but I've always found it um, even more interesting what, what brings parties to the, to the table of, of peace. You know, like it's obviously there's either forces have their own, you know, levels at the time, you know, their own experience, you know, they, they fight a series of battles and conflicts and skirmishes that drags on for a protracted period of time, you know, men die, supplies dwindle. What, what brings the person to the table? You know, generally it's a, it's an overwhelming victory. You know, there, there, there may have been a series of, you know, victories and defeats and, you know, running battles over the period of time, but it's a big victory generally that, that brings people to the table. But then the pretext for peace is there, but then how the peace plays out is also very interesting. Like you can have a, 
an extremely bad piece, you know, a piece that just isn't almost worth having, you know, like for example, the Treaty of Versailles at the end of uh, World War One was an extremely bad piece, you know, like it was far too harsh on the on the Germans and, uh, you know, led to German nationalism throughout the thirties and, and what happened in World War Two after that, you know, but to get a good piece, you know, like it has to be a lasting piece, you know, it has to take, um, you know, even though, the victor will obviously to the victor go to the spoils, you know, the, the loser still has to be accommodated before because the loser will only be the loser for a period of time, you know, within a generation, two, three at the most, that force will be, be ready to do war again, you know, and, and the good piece is the piece that can can withstand that period of time. So yeah, just on that side of things, pieces is, is, is a fascinating thing in its own right. They used to sacrifice and, a chick for peace or a princess or some type of thing, like to, to unite both sides, a beautiful virgin stepped in the mix. Like that's how, is that, is that what happens? Should we just get a bunch of strippers and blow for like Putin and everybody just be like, Hey, uh, offer. Uh, they're probably so, doing it anyway. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I think those stories too, with the, um, you know, the things that make you happy in that they're sort of presented for, I think everyday people and, often they're given for the reasons to go to war as well. Um, whether it's the, the stealing of someone or like carrying someone off like the Trojan war, but it's like a, a national identity almost. And um, I'm very more, far more cynical with that sort of stuff. And I think it's all, it all comes down to economics in the end, but you're trying to convince everyone else to go to war. So you pick something that's going to um, put fire in their bellies and, and you often try and find some sort of symbol that's going to, to do that and um yeah but on, on the on the thing you're talking about with the, the piece as well and, and especially with the the versailles stuff i mean and, and you often find this in most wars if a, a side's defeated and um and the terms are quite harsh and there is room there for revenge and hatred of of their past enemies um that's usually the side that learns much more from the conflict that, that uh, was fought the um the victors tend to, I guess, become more conservative. They think, well, those tactics won. This is how you fight a battle these days. But the, uh, the, the loser goes back to the drawing board and they're like, well, how do we uh, overcome this? How do we, how do we get around these uh, tactics and whatnot? And that's where you see innovation, especially in, in military strategy and, and whatnot occur. And it's you know, basically learning those harsh lessons, lessons to uh, start with. Do you think that monarchies in a sense are maybe the point of why we're in the situation that we're in? Like, it seemed like when you're worried about just protecting one person or one person government, even the presidency, I would say, even a democracy is technically like a monarchy in a sense, maybe more, I guess, more power to people as well, too. But I feel like the people really don't have in any idea of what's really going on like a lot of people can crap on the states and say well they did this and this and this i'm like yeah but you got to understand what are they not telling you that is also covering up why they did that like there's always something else there there's always a reason why someone does something whether you want to look at both sides or not i just try and keep that in the back of my head whenever i analyze a situation like there's probably a whole another perspective we don't even have included into this russia conversation as well too that we're just not seeing um but i feel like the establishments from a king to a city controlling and being the ruler. I just feel like there's been a lot of building off of the ideas of one person, but what happens when that person gets assassinated or that person gets out of office or whatever, then that person's goal that they were heading towards gets stopped. And you have a bunch of these bar graphs or you have like, take a bar graph, a bunch of bars on the graph that are all at like five and 10% because they never got to fulfill what they were going for. So you have a bunch of unfinished pieces of work. And maybe that's in the situation that we're in. There's been a lot of people that have just been worried about their own idea, not trying to profit or maybe emphasize someone else's. And that's why you see like with a lot of like uh, China and Russia, for instance, if you have a law, like a family that keeps inheriting power, they're all moving towards the same goal. Like they're all, there's still the initials idea, like, oh, that's my father's idea. So I'm going to build upon that. And I'm going to build upon that. Not in everywhere else. I mean, especially in the States and in the UK, if you're getting elected for something like that, like yeah, you have the queen, but. I mean, does she really have, does anybody believe that she's running shit? Like, I don't believe Biden's running shit. I don't think she's running it. Um, it's weird. She owns every swan though. I find that so nuts. Um, but I'm, I look at it like you just don't have I'm not even saying that it, it, we should have monarchies or anything like that. But I'm saying this is what happened when the legacy or the kingship was built upon that initially from the start. Because that was seen as the most productive because you have one person getting everything they want, has all the power, whatever you want to say. We've seen it end terribly, 
But when it comes to where we're at now, where we're getting constantly new people in there, and it's usually different like states, for instance, different parties, they're not going to continue with the other, their, their opposite, their enemies, parties, situation, or whatever they were trying to pass. It's always every single presidency. We expect new change, but we never branch out of the two sides. So I look at it like, is this just a, a long lasting effect from starting off with just one person owning all this power? Like if there was a, an equal ship amongst people in the beginning, would we live in a better society today? Is this timeline just kind of screwed in a sense? Yeah, look, um, I guess democracy it gives you, you know, ostensibly more stability than, than monarchy. You know, monarchy, there was always the question of succession when a, when a monarch passed, um, which created a lot of instability within, within countries and could often lead to civil war and fracturing of, of nations, you know, with democracies, even though, you know, like it's, it's the power of the people at the heart of every democracy. And, and the same was true in you know Athens famous for its democracy or, or our modern democracy they're, they're really a almost an oligarchic um gerontocracy at the top of things like you know like it's really just a bunch of rich old guys that are you know controlling you know either side of the political statement now but there was always two parties there was always the you know the conservative party in the ancient times and the and the more sort of you know democratic party I guess you could say um in ancient times um that's what really is governing things, you know, for us right now, you know, so it's yeah, whether it's you one side or the other, it's the same people, you know, they're, they're sort of the same families. They're the same types of, of, you know, images of, of, of what a politician is supposed to be. Like everybody fits into the slot, right. And that's just the way it works at the moment. Yeah. They were, um, I guess, democracy between now and, and back in ancient Athenian times was very different as well. I mean, you had, um, now we kind of outsource all of our um, decision making to our politicians. So we have elected officials who do all the voting and, and put things forward. Whereas back in um, ancient Athens, you would have had, I guess, plebiscites taking place. So often when big decisions are made in a democracy, they put it out to a vote to the citizens to see what they think about a certain topic. But that was kind of happening all the time in Athens where everyone that could make it um, would would vote on a particular um, topic, whether it was to go to war, but um, everyone that was voting also had a much, well, they had a stake in it because if they went to war, they were basically sending themselves to war as well. So everyone was very um, directly connected to those decisions that were being made. But it is, um, I guess it is an age old question is what's the best form of, um, of government, isn't it? Um, I was just thinking when you're talking to in, in Herodotus, he has um, the Persian king, uh, Darius, um, when he uh, goes through a bit of a succession crisis with the, the Persian throne and he uh, ends up taking it, they have a discussion on how Persia should be ruled and they go through monarchy and democracy and oligarchy and they go in these roundabout uh, tales to where they always come back to monarchy saying whatever government you go through, you always end back in, in with a monarchy. And um, that was kind of the view and it justified uh, what they came about. Also, I also think um, Herodotus was kind of a bit sceptical of democracy in the first place as well, just through other things that he, he reports too. But um, it's yeah, it's an age-old question. And from what I understand, like, I mean, later on, you know, we get to Republican times, especially with, uh, with Rome. From what I understand, a republic is built on those three power structures too, where you're trying to balance a democracy, oligarchy, and monarchy in that same form of government. And that's supposed to balance each of them out. And depending, I mean, it can get out of control depending on which one of those um, takes, I guess, is able to gain more influence or um, yeah, be swayed in a certain way that can, that can alter how a republic looks. And because you have many republics that look different around the world at the moment. Yeah, but there's, they, they all have something very similar in common. Like you talked about that structure. There is, there's always the, you know, the people there's always the, you know, the, the Senate or the, the oligarchy and there's always the, the monarchy, you know, there's, there's somebody with a kingly power, like, you know, and so in, in the States, for example, which is a, you know, sort of a modern democracy, like the president sort of fulfills that position, um, you know, and it's a similar sort of, like, there's always got to be that kingly power, it just has a different name, um, you know, the Romans famously rather than, than have a king, they, they were tyrannicides, they got rid of their, got rid of their kings, um, the kings weren't worth keeping around when they founded their republic, as a, I guess, a, a type of democracy, they they split the kingly power. They had a they had two kings every year, 
um, to consuls and they ruled for, for one year apiece and then they were, you know, re-voted in for new consuls. So that supreme power, the power that's, um, you know, that, that you've got to be worried about that can, you know, be tyrannical. Dictatorial power needed to be curbed, you know, at every chance that it, it could get. And, you know, but at the end of the day, it's better to have, uh, you know, as fewer people as possible with that kind of power. Like if you put that power, the power to, you know, to go to war, to commit atrocity, um, to change policy, to, to affect people's lives. Uh, if you give that power to, you know, the majority, uh, which is the case in Athens, um, then they have, the, they have the power of life and death at the drop of a hat. And the Athenians were renowned for, uh, for abusing that power. And also, interestingly enough, quickly feeling the guilt after it. Um, you know, I could cite the, the Mytilenean uh, debate, which happened during the Peloponnesian War, where they one day decided to um, execute every male on an island, um, island city that had uh, revolted from their alliance. Um, and then upon the morning, waking up and feeling nice and remorseful, like, you know, decided to vote to save everybody. So they had to send an even faster ship than the ship that they were sending to, you know, command, command the death. So you're done with that kind of power. Um, in, in the hands of the people, I'm afraid it just gets abused too much. And there's a million other ones that Athens did as well. Mark probably knows more than I do. Well, that's also a good um, explanation for Russia, for instance. I, I don't think a lot of people are in agreement with what's going on over there. And I think a lot of people go, well, like you said earlier, it's not Russia. It's just certain figureheads that are moving these types of things. A lot of people, they don't really have a say. It's not as free as you know we might think in the States or something like that. They don't have, it's really kind of like, okay, I guess we're in this. I don't agree with this, but I'm not going to say anything in fear that you might be locked up or something of that sort as well too. Um, but I think this all comes from an open discussion, like I was uh, telling you, Steve, is that it needs to be back like how it was in the day. I know people say like, oh, it's all disorganized. People are yelling at each other. Well, guess what? Wall Street's like that too. When people are trading stocks, they're screaming on top of each other. They're basically stepping on top of each other. But you know, you don't see you don't see people going to another person's house and shooting them. You don't see any of these types of actions that start to happen because you get your aggression out because more people you can look at it in the sense that more people care about money and that's why they act like that. But that's how the world works. Everyone, all these figureheads of power, they're all worried. Like I bet if you made a deal, and I was thinking about this this morning. I was like, if you made a deal where they just got $100 million every month, every country did to not have any wars with each other, how long, like you say a generation or so, like maybe 20 years, 10 years, then eventually I doubt anybody would really care about going to war. You know what I mean? Like you would just get conditioned to the fact of like you used to get money for it. So there was no point in even doing it. You realize that you can do 10 years without getting paid. Now you can do even longer without having to start a war. There's no reason to, I bet you a lot of people will be like, well, I was getting money at first and eventually they would just be conditioned to the fact that they don't need to start wars. They don't feel like they need to have to right now. It's because a lot of people feel like they want more and they're entitled to more. And that's why they want to take more, but you need to have like, how it was like an auditorium instead of having like we do that with like um the united nations for instance but it's it's tele it's televised you have people that are sitting right like um yaomi park has the best uh i guess um example of this now she's a north korean defector now she's openly spoke out about how like north korea is just uh, crazy like bad just like that tennis player um from it was it was it north korea as well too or china that spoke about one of the politicians china, yeah and now she's like i don't remember ever saying that so we have you on video saying it. i never said that it's like no okay something happened to you in the two weeks that you were missing or almost a month that you were missing um but the north korean defector yeomi park she talked about how when she went there and she's already testified and escaped north korea they sat her right next to them at the united nations like, do you think that she's going to openly be comfortable speaking about things just because she's sitting right beside him? That's when you do want the cameras rolling to make sure she doesn't get killed right in front of everybody. But you need to have like an understanding that if you're going to talk about issues and we know all these people are not getting along, we know there's side trade deals going on and inner workings that are going on. Some people are aware of those inner workings. Like I know you two that are sitting over there looking at me and whispering. I know you're talking about invading my country. You need to have cameras off and have them go, why the fuck are you talking about? Like, just scream at them, do something. Now, that can go horribly wrong. I understand that. But in a sense, it's like when you're really able to be free and able con to confront without the public worried about like, oh, my God, what do you mean? He knew that we were going to be going to war soon. You need to have these open discussions because they have information that you don't, that the public doesn't have. And when they're thinking about these things and they can't openly express themselves when they can't openly talk about these situations and they have to do it in a professional status, like, you know, you said you weren't going to invade the Ukraine, right? 
I never said that. I said I was going to. Well, what happens if we incentivized you not to? Now, being very professional in your types, even Biden said he talked to, um, was it Putin or was it, I guess, the leader of the Ukraine talking about like about are you going to invade or it might have been Putin um, talking about are you going to invade? He said, no, I wasn't going to do that. It was a completely different argument than what he told the public. It was a completely like hostile type situation where they didn't get to agreement on anything, but it out in the media put out there that oh, it went perfectly well and there's no fear anymore. There's no worry. It's like this is the one time I haven't seen them fear monger or do anything to strike a fear narrative where I'm like, you just need to have it where I understand, like, I want the public to be open on everything. I think that we should have all the information. I think everyone should know what and shouldn't be controlled by a certain narrative, but you got to understand the other side of that is that there's stuff that you don't know because they don't want you to know because they don't want you overreacting or freaking out. And that is what social media has done. Social media has hijacked the narrative. And back to what I was saying about like looking up these theories of the mind and all that and coming across people that have been labeled like white nationalists or something like that. Are they or is someone just labeled them that? Have they openly been racist? Have they openly said that they want the white race to succeed? If that's true, then fuck that person. But if they haven't said that and someone has laid a claim on them like that, that's not fair to that person because now you have just besmirched their name. That's a defamation of character, which happens all the time on social media. People will call people racist for no no reason. They call Ben Shapiro a Nazi. Like you're looking at it like, is he though? Or did someone just confuse what he was saying? I have no clue. I'm not defending him. I'm just saying you have to try and find it out yourself and understand that when you have social media being your main connections, when you're having Zoom calls, when you're having all these types of things, even televised, you're not seeing what's actually happening. You get a, a shaking, shaking hands in public, and then behind the back, they're talking shit on you. You got to look at the whole perspective here. And I think this is what their whole point is that you don't need to know this information, which I can understand from. Yeah, it all comes down to trust again, doesn't it? And um, what's your and like what you're saying with it, you know, smearing someone as well. It, it's a it's a good way of, I guess, not having to actually attack the actual argument. You can if you can demonize the person and show that person to be evil or or not worth the trouble, then you sort of get out of having to actually address um, any any uh, theories that they put forward and that may even challenge yours, which is or an all too common tactic that you see in, in all realms of, you know, politics or just um, people talking online and, and all sorts of things. That's, I guess, one of the most common tactics is to, um, you know, just belittle someone's argument by, uh, by defaming them uh, personally. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like the bar for, for what's racism in 2022 is probably about at an all time low. Um, like, you know, you very little needs to occur in order to have the uh, slogan of racism chucked around. It's a it's a default position for a lot of arguments that you see that it's you know because of of racism, um, and you know the mere mention of words like that um, transphobe, um, Islamophobe, you know misogynist, bigot. Um, you know these words don't really require any evidence whatsoever to to have an effect. You know the the moment you're slapped with something like that. Um, you can't help but seem guilty. You know, it's a, it's a natural reaction to to defend yourself against such an accusation, um, and that's really just a it's a poor tactic. It's intellectually lazy. You know, rather than engage um, in a topic of discussion, people just you know use those types of words, and you know the discussion automatically shifts somewhere else. You know, it's not just the the participant that's intellectually lazy. It's it's the the crowd in general that's that's you know following on Twitter on social media. It's also lazy, you know, like people aren't, aren't looking behind it once that once those words come out, then it's just, the discussion's completely moot. Doesn't matter what you were talking about or how no, no, noble your intentions were, um, particularly racism. That's a that's a really pernicious one that gets used, you know, way, way too much. You know, like racism, um, say in the, you know, I don't know, in America in the in the twenties and the thirties, you know, looked like, you know, burnt crosses and guys with, you know, bed sheets over their heads running around hanging people from trees like that's you know that's that's racism you know like that's you know it's what the nazis did to to the jews in world war ii like you know that you know, you know mass extermination of a you know of six million people um that's that's racism you know like saying something you know morally amb ambiguous or, or putting forward a, a point of view that um you know it doesn't fit the mainstream narrative that's not racist that's just how discussion should happen do you feel like 
especially in today's age as well, too, when it comes to the ideas or thoughts that get put out there, a lot of people would just label them as something which might, you would think in an era that we're so new age now that you would be striving for all ideas of innovation. Like it seemed like back in the day, I would say, um, not even like 50 years ago, like way longer than that. Um, there just was a lot more, I would say, innovation or individual thought. Now it seems like it's a lot of group thinking and a lot of group mentality. Like when Martin Luther put his thesis on the church wall or church doors, like, yeah, he got locked inside of his house. Do, do we want to do that today? Do we want to lock people up? Do we want to make them silent? Do we want to label them as something or do we want to ban them off of social media or whatever it is? It's the same like you're doing like there were individuals back in the day that were innovators. Galileo, you know, maybe he was put on house arrest, you know, because he started saying that, oh, we don't revolve. The planets don't revolve around the earth. Or we all revolve around the sun. That was crazy. And they put him on house arrest and never let him leave. Like even they would stop his food orders that were coming to his house. You start getting to like this point where it's like, do we want to do that now? Or should we be looking at pseudoscience, pseudoarchaeology, pseudobiology, whatever you want to label as like, oh, a false science. Is it possible that with even with the COVID, like the mismanagement of the whole pandemic, when it comes to information and types of vaccines and all this type of stuff that's been out there, you've seen the whole narrative flip. And it's like, do you want to do that now, even with those things? Imagine if one of those theories that person has is right. Is it possible that it could be all of them at once and someone's just coming across different information than you? And why should we silence them? Like maybe back in the day, it was a little bit less hostile in that sense, because if people didn't like what you were saying, you could honestly get up and just leave. You can't really do that now. There's not really the viable option to just get up and move. You know, people say, oh, you can move anytime you want. Not really. It's very, very hard to even just be able to afford what you have right now. And it's getting harder and harder every single day. At least back then, you didn't have to worry about like, you know, I, I mean, you had to pay a tax, but I wouldn't say it's like what it is now, or maybe it's the equivalent from what it is now to what it was back in the day. It just seemed like you were able to actually have an individual thought without having to worry about a certain situation where you would be put up or strung up for your crimes, unless it was something that really was like witchcraft or something like that, where people thought you were just batshit nuts. Um, and even then, we that has a horrible history behind it as well, too. I'm just looking at the concept of when an innovative idea or when just an idea comes out there when you start denying that idea you start blocking individual thought and that's going to lead upon generations upon generations of people who aren't going to want to have individual thoughts and fear that they're going to be punished for doing so and that's kind of what i see it leading in towards and i don't i don't think i've ever seen that throughout history maybe in another country's history sure but at least in the history of like the human species at least from now from way back in the day, you've never really seen that with the general consensus of the public where there's an overall fear of thinking a certain way. You have people fighting you, sure, but you don't have like an overall suppression of ideas being brought up in younger kids. Your parents would try and guide you as well as they possibly could. But at the same sense, you still had your creative ideas and your own innovative thoughts. That's why when you look up like pseudoscience or anything like that, there's thousands, a whole list of just pages upon pages of them, but they all date from like 1872 to like 1500s to the plate, uh, Plato, Platoism, you know, it goes way far back. And it's like, maybe, we should strive for that today, not trying to spread more misinformation, which is not what it is, but that's what people hear. What it is, is that people having an individual progress and experience, and that's what you need to try and understand, because if you're all about understanding, shouldn't you be letting all valid opinions or all valid thoughts into the conversation, not just blending in the narrative of just one? I think it's very, I don't know, I, I think... I Perhaps what we experienced. <laughs> I think what we experienced today is very similar to, I think, all through history. Um, the big difference is we see, I guess, a larger cross section of of um, people from all different classes. Whereas when we're looking back in history, we're not really seeing the everyday person so much, and it's harder to, I guess, capture uh, public thought and and what was going on, but. I think when it comes down to innovation, I think you have a very similar thing going on where you had innovators. And like you said, they were, those innovators were getting, you know, uh, crucified or they'd get exiled, they'd get 
um, well, forced to take hemlock in, in uh, prison like Socrates. Um, he was, you know, supposedly corrupting the, the minds of the youth uh, for his ideas. And I think so the majority of people, I think, do go along with the accepted uh, thought that of the time. And it's these innovators, like what happens today, if someone has a, a different theory on, on something and they put it forward, they're often uh, uh, trashed in public. They're shown to, you know, it's all, you know, like you said, pseudoscience. And um, perhaps it's with time, because when we see these ideas come out now, it looks like, you know, it's they're constantly being trashed and it's all pseudoscience and whatever else. But when it comes to history, uh, perhaps the same sort of thing was going on and it would be a generation or two before people would realize, hey, hang on a sec, these ideas are actually right and they're, they're true. And it's, it's just because of the passage of time, it seems like that that's just been an accepted view forever. But I do think um, majority of people tend to go with the accepted view and especially uh, the accepted narrative of the power structure in place because that's the path of least resistance. In the end, it's the safer option uh, as opposed to innovation and uh, sticking your neck out and uh, perhaps supporting an unpopular idea. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, you also got to remember that the, the I guess, the predominant force that, that drove culture and, and what was acceptable um, to society was religion for, for a very long, you know, long part of our history, um, you know, particularly long, whether, whether it was, you know, before Christianity, you know, like the, the gods were still a predominant, a sort of prominent force in, in everybody's life. And, and, you know, that's borne out even in, you know, Bronze Age and Stones, Stone Age sites that there were, you know, sites of, of sanctity and, and worship, you know, like that's always been, you know, what's, what's dictated, what the gods said. Now, of course, it was, you know, you know what man said, but, you know, given the force of, of the voice of God or the gods, um, you know, these words could become become law. And that's what drove, you know, cultural acceptances, you know, and anybody when they're outside of that could be accused of, you know, heresy or the equivalent and, you know, promptly burnt at the stake or, stake or pushed off a cliff. Um, you know, and as, as um, the great Dostoevsky said uh, that, you know, when man kills God, we have to be very careful with what we replace God with. And, and you know, that obviously happened, you know, God's been, been largely killed off in the, you know, systems of government and state in the Western world anyway. Um, and, you know, humans by their very nature look for religion. It's, it's what we, you know, bounded, you know band, bonded ourselves to for, for millennia. And that's what's happened again, you know, except the new religion now is, you know, a religion of, of, of you know, fake cultural purity, you know, like it's all about, you know, if, if there, it's got to be diverse enough, you know, like everything's got to be, you know, equitable, you know, there's got to be more inclusivity, you know, at the expense of, you know, at, I guess societal norms and, and, you know, probably, and to be, and to be honest, proper practice, that's the biggest problem that, that innovation has. It's trying to break through those, you know, restraints, whether it's, you know, the old style religion or the, the new style religion. Do you think that, because we have, it seems like religion is still a thing, but it's obviously not as powerful as, as it was back in the day, at least when it becomes to just one religion, not just, it seems like there's many forms now, or just people choose not to believe. I wouldn't say that's the fix, though. I feel like a lot of it does prey on like the fear aspect, but the issue is, is when you don't believe in a God or when you don't fear a God, you start thinking yourself mighty as a God. And that's when you start seeing the power of control start to leak in, feeling like you might, I guess feel entitled to more than what you already have. And I feel like that's a big issue. A lot of times today is that people feel like they deserve more than what they have in a sense. Sure. Um, I believe in some aspects. Yeah. But I think there's a large amount of like people that feel like their world is the only one that matters, not the one that goes around and like everyone's experiencing their own reality in a sense. Like how many people really worry about what their neighbor is going to be doing or if they make noise is their neighbor going to care i could tell you there's been construction in my neighborhood for like the past week and a half and it has been fucking horrible trying to sleep and someone's just nailing you know hammers into a or nails into a roof like they don't care because they got to do what they got to do they have their own mindset going on so like the the idea of group thinking of a we i'm just trying to figure out when did the narrative get lost that we stopped thinking of each other as a human species and we start dividing ourselves into classes i mean um did that boil down from like 
ancient history because I, I I know recently I talked to a, a Roman archaeologist who talked about like it was only really the wealth class who knew how to read and write that were being able to record history books and things that we are able to look at now um, in a sense of just well like journals or whatever there wasn't really like the common person that knew how to be literate enough to be able to do so and I'm like well that's going to blend a whole different narrative and create a whole different story like I would love to go back and you know, get their information or hear their thoughts or see those types of things. Cause I bet it would be a completely different situation that we're in. I mean, you're in a place now where there's like, a, I had a guest talk about woke archeology. span She's being sued by her university and being like, you know, people are trashing her all because she uh, wasn't, I guess there was a certain narratives on a site that she was investigating into. It was like a native American site or something like that. And um, apparently if you're like menstruating, you can't like go near the site. And it was like a bunch of stuff where it's like kind of weird, but it's a tradition in a sense. So you're just still like, that's still like what, but people are like, you're not being respectful. And then she got attacked by like a woke mob. Um, like, do you, do you really want to like, just look at the fact of like, we're, losing key information and we're losing like basic functions of personality upon like oh is this person you know there's a guy who talked about um his name's matt walsh uh he kind of like uh, the trans community hates him because he's like when they check your bones it tells you if you're a male or female like when you check the thing and a lot of people don't like that whatever i'm not even going to get into that aspect of things but in a sense do you want to lose record or recorded history on a sense of like just because it was a certain gender like if someone gets found they found bones of like a ten thousand year old skeleton or something like that are am i going to have an archaeologist that finds that and goes i'm not going to say the gender of it because i don't want people to attack me it's like well what is it though it's like that's the thing it's like oh it's 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 unknown it's like what do you mean it's unknown you can tell me the answer i know you know it so why don't you just tell me it? and you're afraid that's when we start getting into the part of science Science is afraid to establish things. Researchers are afraid to research things all in a fear aspect of what society will attack them for when they're really just giving you what they what they've been taught, what they've been what they've learned to analysis or be able to find. Do you rather want the real history or do you want the history that best fits your narrative? Because that's how we get George Washington saying his teeth were made of cherry wood when really they were made of slave teeth and everyone freaked the hell out because you, you it, it's for the narrative. I don't care about the narrative. I want the facts. I want to know what the actual historical thing is. So we don't end up where we're at now, where everyone's attacking each other over simple shit. You can't do that because now we're hindering our own growth and we're hindering our own progress. I mean, if we had journals from people who were just peasants back in the day, rather than just the royal class, would you have a whole different story? Would you have a whole different narrative? Would you have a whole different ideal of maybe where the society would be at today? Probably. But you only had certain people that wanted to include the details that were important to their life and what they thought was valuable compared to like the actual issues that might have actually been happening at the time period that we're starting to learn from like archaeological sites and shit. Okay, I'm going to go back a bit here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, back to where you were talking about where we start to lose these personal connections. Um, I think I may have brought this up before in one of our talks uh, a while ago. And it's to, to do with like homo sapiens and our ability to socialize because it's it's thought that perhaps as as humans we can make personal meaningful personal relationships with about 150 different uh, individuals and this is where a lot of uh, settlements were set up set up on and um so i think perhaps we can start to see these deep connections or well, the beginning of uh disconnection take place is when settlements started to merge and become larger and one of the abilities that we have as uh, homo sapiens is to be able to uh, develop abstract ideas to identify each other with. So the whole um, concept of, uh, for example, myself and Steve, we can identify with each other because we're both Australian. And so in a room of different people, we can find common ground and chances are we'll probably strike up a conversation and be able to get along. Um, and these are where the whole identity of it being an Australian is kind of an abstract idea in itself. And this was kind of, I guess, the idea with Homo sapiens was why we could function in larger groups is because we could agree upon certain ideas that don't perhaps exist in reality, but we agree they exist. And then I guess when you meet opposing groups, they perhaps have 
uh, other agreed upon abstract ideas that don't align with the ones that we had in the first place. And um, it just snowballs from there. And especially as history goes on, then it, it, it moves from just familial groups that have differences that, to nations and, and it, yeah, it snowballs from that, that point of view. Yeah, and like, you know, nationalism gets born out of, I guess, that, that sort of concept as well. You know, like these, obviously, you know, individual groups uh, you know, develop on their own accord. They get their own, you know, quirks of language. They get their own customs, their own cultural, you know, abnormalities. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, they get, you know, they synoicize, they, they join together, you know, and they form a, a greater conglomerate. But there's always that... Um, I guess, desire for the division to, to remain. Um, you can see that with uh, the modern you know, sporting teams, you know, like it's a, it's a great way to get behind something that not everybody gets else gets behind and, you know, back that team in, in competition against other people. Like there's always got to be that division and we've sort of, you know, outsourced that desire now to, to sport largely. But, um, you know, in ancient times, those, those divisions within society would have, would have led directly to war or at the very least, you know, conflict of some description. Um, that's the only way that they, they were sorted out, then people could come together after that. So, um, you know, I would just probably comment on, on that and just ex express that that division is, is probably, you know, a very natural state of being for humankind, homo sapiens, as, as you say, Mark. Um, you know, the fact that they come together at all, um, you know, is, is a real surprise to me, considering, you know, what I understand from history. Have you both ever come across anything through your learnings or just doing the podcast in general that you don't necessarily agree with the narrative that was placed in front of you? Like for Icarus, I know a lot of people get the story of like, oh, he too, he flew too high to the sun. And it was like, you know, it was about listening or something like that. I look at it like that's a person with ambition. You got to understand that there's a consequence when you take that shot. I mean, maybe I'm just like optimistic in that sense but i feel like that's kind of like everyone knows the narrative of like oh kids they're young and they're reckless and they're crazy well i mean did you expect him not to just get caught up into the moment i think that's about not really about the amount of time that you have but what you do with the time that you get and that was always a narrative that was kind of like told when you heard the story which was like oh he flew too high he didn't listen i'm like well i mean what did you expect like the fact that him and his dad were flying together. Like if you're a father, you will keep your eyes on your fucking kid 24 seven, no matter if you're escaping from a prison or not, like you understand, they're not going to listen to you. What kid listens to their parents half the time. Most of them don't. So I look at it as like, I take the optimistic side out of it, which is like, you're going to get a lot of shots placed in front of you and you can choose to let them all pass and you can live the easy life and it could be long and kind of dull and boring, or you can take the shot. And if it fails, it fails. It's like starting a business. How many people start a business and it ends up going to put, but they took the shot to do so. I mean, give them credit for that much, having the ambition to be able to do so. That's what I pulled out of that story. I'm just curious upon your guys uh, learning or research or working on a future episode or an episode that you've done. Have you seen a narrative that was placed in front of you that you necessarily didn't agree, or maybe you had a different perspective of the situation than the one that was given to you? Um, well, when it comes to myth, like what you were saying, I, I'd find it interesting because I, I'm of the opinion that there's tends to be a kernel of history or truth within all those different stories and what it is can be hard to tell sometimes. And the accepted view on certain stories that have been told and what they're supposed to mean, I feel like it's it's almost like it. Well, I mean, where did we come? Where, who who came up with that idea, and why are we going with that idea when there could be perhaps other alternatives that, who knows, maybe in the past were broached, but this became the dominant idea and it was what was taught and how we should look at this story. But I think you're right um, with mythology. I think there's many many different interpretations you can have on different stories and what they could possibly be meaning. It's, I think, our thinking today is, I think, more, um, uh, I guess, swayed by past interpretations and then what has come down through what's been taught through schools and, and whatever else. But, um, yeah, I think when it comes to mythology, you need a bit more freedom of thought when uh, reading some of those stories. Yeah, I'm with, uh, yeah, I'm with Mark on that one. You know, myths, myths can be a, an extremely funny thing. You know, some of them, um, obviously, definitely have a kernel of truth um, at the heart of them. Um, some of them are, are moralistic in nature and, and don't necessarily need to feed into anything, you know, particularly factual, like, you know, you cited the Icarus and Daedalus one there. That's, you know, a, you know, man's reach exceeding his, you know, his grasp, so to speak. That's the old, the old story there, but, you know, 
as far as the myths, myths go for themselves, you know, these, these are incredibly old stories. You know, they're, they're archetypal in nature. Um, you can see a lot of the crossover from, um, from Greek myth into, you know, more Eastern myth like Sumerian and, and areas like that. Um, you can even see that with some of the Bible texts as well. You can find that in, in um, you know, far older, you know, texts that have been have been found clay tablets that have been found like those stories are, are very old you know and, and i'd suggest that they that those myths in general especially the ones that are very common you know the story of the um you know slaying the dragon you know so to speak you know whatever that it's a metaphorical dragon or an actual you know beast or the you know rescuing your your father you know those, those sorts of stories you know or the or the the tyrannical mother those stories would would predate you know literacy itself you know these these would be purely oral stories that have come down you know, like the flood myth is probably a good one. That's probably one that, you know, we, you know, we're, we're talking, God only knows when languages are out. You know, it could be tens of thousands, could be, it could be a hundred thousand years. Some of these, these stories go back, you know, and they, we, we need stories in this day and age, you know, it, it, nobody's any different today. Like the stories have changed, but, um, you know, mythology springs up around all sorts of things, you know, whether it's, you know, a sporting event, a, a conflict, you know, like you're given enough time and that's just who, how humans are naturally geared, I think, to, to mythologize, you know, like to, to have a story, you know. Mm. And you find much of the uh, same archetypes in, in mythology. I mean, you watch Lord of the Rings or something like that, and you see the same archetypes that would appear in mythology and uh, the same themes that, that occur. It, 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 and I guess even in the, uh, in the Bible, you, you see a lot of the same themes keep reoccurring in, in many different cultures. They just seem to be a, a human truth that uh, seems to, uh, doesn't age. It, it's, it's always told in another um, another way in some other society it's but yeah the themes and archetypes always stay the same um i must i, I read um i don't know if you've read joseph campbell's the hero of a thousand faces um it's basically a look at the whole concept of um uh the archetypical type characters um the whole story behind the hero going on a quest or an adventure and how these appear in cultures all around the world and i remember reading that um it's quite it's not a light read anyway, but um, I remember reading that and then I watched, uh, I think it was all three of the Lord of the Rings again. And my appreciation for those movies just, you know, was far greater than I the first time one. I watched them. I can't do it. That's, that's one series <laughs> I don't want to watch ever. Yeah, the, the truly successful series like that, they do, they, they get all the archetypes right. You know, that's why Harry Potter was, was so uh, popular as well. Like, you know, that thing is just like completely loaded with archetype, you know, and hmm. if you get those things together and, they, and they're working in harmony, those are the things that have become truly popular. Even Star Wars, yeah. Yeah, well, it's yeah. Just, it's something that's yeah. different from the normal, like the mysticism behind it. Like um, I was talking to a, a skeptic. Uh, she's part of the Skeptical Inquirer. Her name's Deborah Hyde. Uh, she studies specifically like dealings with like uh, the folklore behind things like werewolves, um, magic, all that type of stuff that some people believe to be real as well, too, but also tries to find an explanation of it as well, too. Like uh, people saying that they've been captured by UFOs or people saying they saw a vampire, or they saw some type of creature in the dark or, you know, where these folklores and myths kind of come from. It's kind of your brain like imagination i would say kind of taking a hold of a lot of like these optical illusions in some sense but like she just tries to understand the psychology behind it and that's what i've really tried to un understand about like how people's minds work in a sense like whenever you know you hear a folklore the only time i ever want to hear in a myth or like some type of like religious thing when i want to hear the term i don't know is when you're trying to come up with an interpretation for what you just read Whenever someone asks a question to religion, it's usually the answer of I don't know or whatever this type of thing is even a good teacher that's studying myth or teaching you about Greek mythology. They go, well, we just really don't know like we don't have that evidence. And it's like, that's what I like to hear because it leaves it open for interpretation. But there's so many narratives out there that fit like, oh, well, this is what this means. And this is what this means. I'm like, how do you know, man? Like, were you there when he was writing it down or whoever was writing it down and coming up with the story? It could mean an interpretation of things. That's the whole point of legends is that you have like, oh, Bigfoot's not even really a legend. That's an urban legend. But I mean, actual like religious kind of like the Ark. Every, every uh, I guess, civilization talked about some type of great flood. So can one, it doesn't all have to involve Noah saving the whole planet that can be one certain thing this flood happens through all these different recorded histories so i start wondering 
Is that something bigger? Is that something deeper? Leave that open to interpretation, but you have so many people going, no, that's not what it is. It's hundred percent this. And that's when I start to draw the line because this is where we talk about the blocking of innovation of thought. You need to have everyone coming up with ideas to the table and not dismiss any single one where you see an open communication of ideas and even, even simple stuff when it comes to like, uh, you do an episode and someone criticizes you for it. That's that person's interpretation and that information. You're not going to get 100% of the accurate information because we don't have 100% of the accurate information. Even the uh, all the dinosaur bones that have been collected and put in museums and stuff. There's no dinosaur sculpture that's 100% complete. You're missing something. So if you can be okay with that, why can't you be okay with someone's interpretation of something and just take that for what it is, a thought in that person's experience, rather than trying to be like, well, no, I need to fact check this, and truth check this. That term is dead. I want to see it buried in a ditch. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you have that sort of criticism taking place too, it's often, especially when it comes to ancient history too, you're potentially attacking someone's perceived identity as well, what they believe to be true or where they've come from. Uh, based on, and this could be based on traditions and myths too. Of, um, I mean, you see this all through Greek history, like the founding of cities and whatever, and and where um, families originate from. You know, many kings would um, try and draw a lineage back to um, Heracles to as an ancestor or another hero. It's or even to gods, um, and that was important to them. And um, nowadays you find people try and draw a, a connection to like a really ancient culture. But if you say present something based on the historical evidence that you have available to you that doesn't align with that, their uh, worldview, then you're kind of attacking their, their perceived um, identity as well. And so I guess I can understand sometimes if someone does have a, uh, a go at you for something like that, but then again, you it becomes frustrating because they're not willing to listen to the history. It's ignore everything else. This is what I've been told my entire life, and this is how I identify. And uh, that can become frustrating, which I've had a couple, not too much, but a, a couple of times I've I've had it happen. Yeah, look, um, I actually want to go back and touch back on the on the flood myth. I um I really really I've done a lot of research on the on the flood myth, and it's it's really really interesting how um you know, you're right when you say that, you know, every culture, you know, every, every civilization basically has a, a flood myth, you know, like I, I, I'm not actually aware of one that doesn't, I mean, I'm sure that sure there are, but in general, there is that flood myth at the heart of, of just about every civilization that exists or, or has existed there. And you've got to appreciate, I think, first and foremost, that, that they're probably not the same flood, you know, but like for ancient people, you know, rising water, you know, falling into water, like, you know, drowning was, was a really big risk, you know, and it wouldn't have taken a lot to, you know, absolutely freak people out, you know, it could have been a particularly bad cyclone, you know, or a tidal wave, obviously, which is just a disaster in general. But these stories for people in the ancient times would have been so terrifying. You know, for example, the Romans, um, their chief priest was known as the, the Pontifex Maximus, um, which in later times became symbolically a bridge between, you know, the Roman people and the gods. But um, originally it, it was a physical bridge um, because the Romans lived on the Tiber River. And, um, you know, the person that could construct something to get the people to the other side safely without drowning was, you know, basically to be treated like a, you know, a holy man. And so the Pontifex Maximus was originally the, the best architect for building bridges, you know, and developed into a purely symbolic role. So that fear of a um, of flood, of drowning, of, um, you know, inundation, that's, that's something that, you know, would have come across society, um, societies at very different times and in very different ways. Like some stories involve, you know, water rising up, you know, where, you know, it's obviously a story about, you know, a lot of rain, um, like in the, the Noah myth, um, you know, or, or stories of, of tidal waves and things like that, you know, but those stories, you know, they leave a scar on civilizations and those things are perpetuated down to the day. And I can see we're just about out of time too, gents. Um, I'm going to bow out for this one. Um, so I'm going to hit the hay, but um, it's been lovely to see you both, Robbie. Yeah, my studio. Great to Mark, see you both. Pleasure. Too. I'm going to link uh, yes. both both your descriptions and uh, podcast stuff. Spartan History Podcast and Casting Through Ancient Greece. Your links will be in the description. Thank you both gentlemen for joining me. Um, I don't want to do it without uh, Steve, Mark. So it looks like we're done too. Um, <laughs> it's been a it's pleasure. Late here too. It's been a pleasure chatting with you guys. And uh, thanks for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank Podcast.